my pleasure to uh, introduce the uh, director of the Melton Centre and the chair of this conference, Professor Jonathan uh, 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 Cohen, who's going to talk about uh, disclosing the oral in the, in the textual Buber and Rosenzweig on the morality of the biblical text. <laughs> <coughs> so we're here, we started a little late, so we're going to overrun up to 10 minutes into the, into the uh, coffee break. Okay. So 25 minutes and now you will find it. Okay. Um, I'm gonna, we, we've had a lot of talk of <clears throat> how morality and textuality interact, merge, or whatever. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of the Buber Rosenzweig translation project, the aim of which was, to a certain extent, to try and recover the original orality of the biblical text within the framework of the translation. We all know that uh, Buber and Rosenzweig strive, that we all know that Buber and Rosenzweig strive not to make the Hebrew text fit a kind of a um, German that everybody could speak, he didn't digest the Hebrew text with all its nuances into a kind of a vernacular German, as to a certain extent Luther did. But rather, he tried to preserve the cadence of the original Hebrew in order people could hear the original rhythm and have the spoke, get the spoken quality of the text, and that much of the translation was set up as <coughs> breath stops. Um, you would read the text by breath stops as it was read aloud. <coughs> so, Part of what I'm going to talk about is how can one recover orality in the thick of textuality as both a philosophical question and an educational question. So educationally, the question then becomes, if the text is really thickly textual, thickly cognitive, needs a lot of very thorough, cerebral analysis, how can there be an educational experience of listening to be, or being addressed within the framework of the text that we're studying very objectively and very cognitively and very analytically. Because once we take that kind of a posture towards a text, don't we close ourselves off to the possibility of being opening, open to hearing a message which is then addressed to us? So the question is, how can we, in the thick of cognitive analysis of the text, whether literary, historical, or otherwise, Rosenzweig prefers literary, as do other Bible scholars of that school, right? Uh, Buber was the father to Mayor Weiss, who was the father to Yair Zakovich. Within the framework of Bible studies, there's a literary school. There's a lot of argument between literary school and others. There's a lot of in-between ground between them. I'm not going to go into all that. But still, Rosenzweig does prefer, if, if already cognitive analysis, he prefers literary analysis. But even within the framework of literary analysis, which is also very cognitive, cerebral, analytic, how can we, in that mode, actually listen to something that's being addressed to us? Um, and I want to deal with that question as an educational question as well. And I want to ask some other educational questions which derive from that, which are also, um, are we supposed to be teaching what could be called religious objectivity or religious subjectivity? Are we supposed to be teaching, as Jewish educators, the canons of the tradition, the practices in the texts? Or are we, to a certain extent, trying to engender a certain kind of religious experience? Can that be done in the very thick of teaching the canon or teaching practices, which seems to be almost anti-experiential by its very nature? Um, also, how, how can this be done without indoctrination? How can the teaching of the canon be done without indoctrination? What's the connection between the aesthetic and the religious element in Jewish education? And these are a couple of questions I'm just going to raise, because I don't have that much time to really do them all. Okay, I'm going to start from Rosenzweig's theory, and then what I'd really like to do is to read a story with you the way that Rosenzweig reads it. Um, first of all, one of the most beautiful things I think about Rosenzweig is that he has a fully developed theology, a fully developed aesthetics, a fully developed aesthetics of reading, a fully developed aesthetics of reading the biblical text, and what flows from that, a fully developed pedagogy of the biblical text, which flows from all of the previous. I'm going to just mention it all very briefly because it's in the star and it's in his beautiful article, The Secret of Biblical Narrative Form, which appears in Scripture and Translation, which Everett Fox put together. And it's a very fine and very sophisticated way of looking at the Bible. Um, theologically, we all know that Rosenzweig divided, <laughs> spoke of creation, 
revelation, and redemption. Now, creation, revelation, and redemption for Rosenzweig have their microcosmic counterpart in texts. Texts are regarded as microcosms. The creational dimension in the world is that dimension that makes the world, as we'd say in Hebrew, asui, done. In other words, it's that dimension in the world in which we can observe the interlocking laws of nature at work. The, we, can, we can look at the divine, we can look at the rational divine plan. We can look at how all the parts form the whole, about how all the parts in the world interact to form the cosmos. Creation is pastness for Rosenzweig. The world, when the world is a done deal in the past, we can observe it from a distance objectively as to how the parts interact with each other to form the whole in a rational, intelligible way. That's the dimension of creation for Rosenzweig. The dimension of revelation is a more individual kind of a dimension. When God turns to the individual human being and says, you have existential worth. I love you. I accept you. I support you. I support you existentially as an individual human being. And the person, the individual person, then sustained by this address, this very personal address, after having reached despair, by saying, I reached the despair at what Heidegger would probably call living towards death, and at their own sin and inadequacy. Having received this love from God, it gives the person the strength to bring about redemption, which means to go out into the world, meet other people, and bring them the kind of love that God brought to that individual in ever-growing concentric circles in the direction of redemption, an endless kind of a process. So much for theology, very short, very inadequate. But what's interesting about it is that all of these dimensions in, in Rosenzweig's theology, creation, right, the interlocking rationality of the cosmos, revelation, the direct address to the individual supporting the individual existentially, and redemption, which is once the individual has the support, then goes out to the world to bring it to others in ever-growing circles, they all have their counterparts in Rosenzweig's aesthetic of, of texts. The text is looked at as a kind of <coughs> microcosmos. It has, it has an epic dimension, which is parallel to the, parallel to the creative, creation dimension in the cosmos. It has a lyric dimension, or an anecdotal dimension, which is parallel to the revelational dimension in the cosmos, and it has a dramatic dimension in which it draws in its readers. Um, I'm going to concentrate, as Rosenzweig does in Scripture and Translation, in the article in Scripture and Translation, the secret of biblical narrative form, I'm going to concentrate on the first two, the epic dimension and the anecdotal dimension. And in the epic dimension, the epic dimension in a story, in biblical narrative, for Rosenzweig, <laughs> Again, the, the rules of the game is that he's right. <laughs> and, right, and then we're going to try and decide if it makes a, you know, serious and coherent philosophy of Jewish education. Right? Is it, I mean, you can always argue whether or not he's right the way he reads, his, he reads the Bible. We're going to start from, Fox used to say this a lot. The rules of the game is that he's right. You have a certain speaker up on the podium, he's right. And now let's see if we can derive any interesting implications from what he has to say. So, um, the epic dimension of the text is that dimension, just like in creation, whereby the parts of the text support the whole. And the whole is expressed by way of the parts. In other words, there's a rational interlocking scheme which makes a beginning and a middle and an end, very much like Aristotle's poetics. The parts mount the whole. The whole is expressed through the parts in a rational way of which you can give a coherent account. Just like you can do this in creation, so you can do this in a text which is well written, a serious narrative. Like there are these kind of in the Bible. The difference between biblical epics for Rosenzweig and other kinds of epics, and this can also be argued with, of course, he says not exclusively, but to a certain extent, is that what the biblical epic seems to be able to do is to incorporate within its framework also a lyrical moment, an anecdotal moment. For example, it, I guess if you compare it to a musical experience, we had a speaker about music. Uh, you go to hear a symphony. So on the one hand, you have the score, and the score can be analyzed <coughs> for its structure, for the you know how the variations play off against each other, for the scheme, for the you know for the rational interlocking of the parts, etc. On the other hand, sometimes you sit in a concert, and there's one chord, and there's one note, 
or there's one kind of a constellation of notes, and you just move to tears. And sometimes you might even say, well, I have to change my life as a result of having heard that chord, or having seen that statue from that angle at that time with this light. That's the lyrical moment. When you somehow feel addressed, when you somehow feel something unique is moving from the text to you as a unique individual person, even within the framework of the fact that the text forms a kind of a cognitive, rational whole. And that somehow the biblical text manages to incorporate the lyrical moment, the anecdotal, what he, what Lovenstein calls the anecdotal moment, within the framework of the epos. An, an anecdote for Rosenzweig is not just something that's not researched well enough. <laughs> that's, you know, it's one academic cuss word, anecdotal, what's another one, um, eclectic, you know, stuff like that. No, that's not what he means. When he says, when he says anecdotal, he means that moment in the story where you, you have to hear what the person has to tell you. It's a matter of life and death to hear what the person has to tell you. You must hear it. Just like when somebody runs from a war and says, there's been a war, people have been killed. And you have to sort of find out, it's, it's serious, you have to, you can't not, something you can't not hear. That's what he means by an anecdote, a real anecdote. So, Rosenzweig believes that the biblical narrative, or many certain biblical narratives, have been able to incorporate this kind of anecdotal moment where something individual from the text jumps out to you as an individual, points to you and says, this is the command of the hour, as a result of which you go make almost a complete turnabout in your life, or at least a significant change, or get a significant change of perspective on your life as a result. Okay? So that's an integration of the epic and the anecdotal moment in the text. So not to waste more time, um, I'd like to try and read one story with you. I'm not gonna, I'd like to read more, but I don't think I'm going to have time. So I want to read the Bilam story in Bal at the beginning of Parashat Balak. And I'm, what I'm going to do is, instead of, that's as much theorizing as I think I'm going to have time to do. <coughs> and since it's also a conference in education, I want to do a kind of a demonstration lesson about how Rosenzweig, I'm not going to do a discussion with you because we don't have time, but I'll try and show how Rosenzweig would read that story on the basis of a few lines in the secret of biblical narrative form I've sort of taken those few lines and expanded them into a kind of shibur on Parashat Balak based on Rosenzweig's insights. Okay? So let's open to Parashat Balak. Bamudbar. Okay. Bamudbar. Esrim Beshtayim. Okay? I'm reading it. Please, uh, you know, Trust me, I'm trying to, at least I'm trying to read it as Rosa, I think Rosenzweig would have read it on the basis of what I, know, what I know how he did read certain passages within the story. Right, yeah, really like, hmm? This he didn't read this one. No, he did. I did. <coughs> <coughs> he, did. he read the bottom story, but it very short, very elusively, yeah. Yeah. and I'm trying to expand his illusions. Vayar Balak ben Sikor et kol Balak sees this. Then it says, then, it, then this, the camera moves to Moab. Vayagar Moab. Doesn't say Vayagor, Vayagor, Slicha. Doesn't say Vayagor Balak. It says Vayagor Moab. Mipnei ha'am me'od, kirabhu, vayakot Moab, bifnei b'nei Israel. We don't know the degree to which Balak knows that this is happening. He apparently isn't doing anything yet. We haven't even been told that he's the king yet. Nachon. Just says we you told his Balak ben Sipor. We haven't been told he's the king yet. Okay? But Balak ben Sipor sees everything they've done, but he doesn't take any action. But then Moab is fearful. Mentioned twice. And then Moab is mentioned a third time. And then there is a kind of a joining, a political joining between Moab and Zikne Midian. Moab Zikne Midian, And then they tell us. Balak ben Zippor Melech Limoab Ba'etahi Gotta do something about it, the king We weren't told that at the beginning When we're given appellations in the story I mean, we have the very people here, Barry and others Called the boss When are we given the appellation? When are we told the title, right? Of the, of the, fact, the fact of his kingship When there seems to be a political alliance being formed Between Moab and Midian And this kind of an undercurrent of dissatisfaction he, he knows what's going on he hasn't done anything about it yet. And at a certain point, when it begins, reaches a crescendo, he's somehow reminded that he's the king, and he begins to do something about it. Okay. Vayishlach malachim el bilan ben ro'or petorah, 
אשר על הנהר, ארץ בני עמו לקרוא לו לאמור. הנה עם יצא ממצרים, הנה כיסה את עין הארץ, הוא רמיין לו בלוקסס, that's an illusion, והוא יושב מולי, בלי מולי, ואתה, לך אנא אר לי את העם הזה, כי עצום הוא ממני, אולי אוכל נקה בו, אגרשנו מן הארץ, כי ידעתי כי אשר תברך מבורך, ואשר תורה ותבור יורך. So if we're given to the first introduction, to the kind of pragmatic, instrumental, magical relationship of Malak, of Balak to seers, right? They're supposed to automatically utter some kind of incantation or some kind of oration, and that's supposed to have a certain effect. We're not quite sure if those Ksamim are in order to enchant Bilam, or in order to give him those Ksamim to do his work. Certain Bible scholars could probably tell us which is more likely interpretation. ויבואו אל בלעם, וידברו אליו דברי בלק. ויאמר אליהם, לי נופו הלילה, והשיבותי אתכם דבר, כאשר ידבר אדוני אליי, וישבו שרי מואב עם בלעם. ויבוא אלוהים אל בלעם ויאמר, מי האנשים האלה עמך? ויאמר בלעם אל אלוהים, בלק בן ציפור, מלך מואב, שלח אליי. הנה העם היוצא ממצרים, ויחס את עין הארץ, אתה לך קו על היותו, אולי יוכל להילחם בו וגרשתיו. Quite accurate reproduction of what Balak has said to him. Vayom Elohim el Bilam. Lo telechim. Period. Lo telechim ahem. Lo tarok ta'am. There's three parts to the sentence. Very chad mashma'i. Lo telechim ahem. Lo tarok ta'am. Ki baruchu. Okay. Vayakum Bilam al-Bokir. Vayom el Sarei Balak. לכו, it's a very subtle sentence, לכו אל ארציכם כי מאין אדוני לתיתי להלוך ממכם. You already get a bit of a hint that he might have wanted to go. הוא לא נתן לי, אולי הייתי רוצה ללכת, אבל אלוהים לא נתן לי. מאין השם לתיתי להלוך ממכם. אוקיי. How do שרי בוריו interpret what they've just now heard? ויקומו שרי מואב ויבואו אל בלק ויאמרו, מאין בלעם הלוכים אני. זאת אומרת, מאין השם תיתי. That's just a way of בלעם saying, right? למעט. It's a personal מיעון on his part. He uses the idea of saying that it's, you know, מאין תיתי, but it's basically מאין בלעם. At least that's how they interpret what בלעם says. And now comes the very first use of what Rosenzweig thinks is the מילת אחיזה, או in German the שטיחות, or the stimulus, the word that creates the question in the mind of the reader, which then has to be answered by further expressions of the word, which he calls the שנינה, which appear later on, which actually address the reader in a kind of a lyrical and anecdotal way. The story is very beautifully structured, it's a, it's a tapestry in the way it's constructed, but we'll see that the Vayosef Od word brings us to a situation whereby, right, we start to ask the question of what's real revelation and what's phony revelation? Because we see the first time, it's not just, and it's also, it's not just Balaam's question, what's real revelation and what's phony revelation? How do we distinguish between them? What's the criteria for distinguishing between them? As we see the first time, he says, what happens the second time? By Yosef, od balach, shloach, sarim, rabnim, nichtadim, As Rosenzweig says, in a Germanic way, but in English we would say, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. That's the pragmatic approach. Okay? Um, if you can't use this formula, try another formula. Try another Herkev Sarin. Try another way of saying it. Try another mountain. Right? If you can't get the result that you want, instrumentally, pragmatically, magically, try another formula. Try another instrumentality. Yosef od balach shalot, shalach shalim ramiv nichbatim leh. ויבוא אל בלעם ויאמרו לו, כה אמר בלק בן ציפור, אל נא, כן, very subtle, תימנע, passive. אל נא תימנע, don't prevent yourself, as it were, as you said, that God's preventing you, but it's actually you, who's preventing yourself from going with us. אל תימנע, מהלוך אליי, כי קבל אחד בית חמאות, בכל אשר תאמר אליי יעשה, ולכו נקה ולי את העם הזה. ויען בלעם ויאמר אל עבדי בלק. And here you have a contrast between a huge bombastic speech 
in which on the one hand, it sounds like a Shas convention, just this morning, you know, I won't do anything except what God tells me, right? Anything what, what, what Rabbi Vadya says, anything what God tells me, that's the only thing that I'll do. But you know what? Hang out a little more and see what God says in a second. Okay, so you, you have the outside part. You say, <laughs> he says, so we have Vayosef for Balak, which is his instrumental way of trying to get his way. And now we have Vayosef of Bilam, which is his instrumental way of trying to get a more convenient dispensation from God. The second time, supposedly, was given the first time. Then the question, of course, comes, why does God play along? Why does God play along? Why doesn't God just say again, Lo telech, they are, right, they're, they're blessed and not cursed, they won't go, etc. But that's not what happens. He's got a second, much more convenient revelation from God, which Rosenzweig explains at one point in the article is actually being God's lending his outer voice to Bilam's inner voice. And actually letting him learn, as we say in education, the derech <laughs> that the road will be blocked. There are two, there are two <coughs> commands from God. One is don't God, <coughs> and one is go, but only say what I tell you. Bilam chooses the second one. But on the course of the path, he will get blocked. And as a result of the frustration from being blocked, you will remember that really the first command is the most important one. And if, as it were, for Balak and Bil'am initially, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. For God, it's the first, immediate, direct, personal address, which doesn't then recur in the same form again, which is the real thing. And that if you try and rework it into a more convenient, Dispensation, and you'd be sure you're going to miss the mark. But God will play along with you, says Rosenzweig. God will let you learn the derech haviluiv, right? That this has been the wrong way to go. So, anyway, what we did from the first by Yosef Od, we know we were told immediately that the motivations of Balak and Bilam are parallel. Just like Balak is motivated by an instrumental, uh, it, instrumental drives to try and get his way by any means possible. So we know now that Balak is also really would like to go and is instrumentally waiting for a dispensation from God to do that also. Vayakum Bilam Haboker, Vayachaboshet Atono, Vayelethim Sarei Boab. Moab, he's very active, as we know, three Pealim, one after the other. And then it says, Vayichar Felohim Kiolechu. Why? He asks it specifically. Why should he get angry at the fact that he's going? He just told him to go. Nachon? Not only that, Bilam actually consented to do what God told him in the very same language that God told him. Kum lech, vayakom, vayelech. Right? He does exactly what God tells him to do. And immediately afterwards he says, vayicharaf ha-shech. Vayicharaf ha-dunai. Elohim, s'tika. Ki olech. Vayit yetzed malach ha-dunai baterech, l'satan lo, v'hu rochev al-atono, u-shnei n'arabimo. Batere et ha-aton, ha-aton et malach ha-dunai. Nitzav baterech. Now, what's, who's, the question is being raised here from a literary point of view, which is the path and who's straying from the path? What does it mean to go on the path? Ostensibly, to walk on the path means to go to Balak's place, to stay on the path, and when the Donkey goes off the path, then what Bilam does is that he hits it to get it back on the path. But that's the wrong path. <laughs> that's the wrong path. Who's, the, who's deviating and who's going? On which path? And which path is the right one? And which is the real revelation and which is the phony revelation? Which is the revelation which has been given in an unmediated, direct, what Rosenstein would call lyrical, anecdotal way to Bilam? Don't go. And it won't be repeated again. As opposed to the one who says, well, you know, go and what I tell you is... Which actually reflects your own inner 
wishes. Actually, what we're getting from Rosenzweig here is a certain kind of a criterion, which is sort of close to Kant in a way, um, even though Rosenzweig was not a Kantian. Um, how do you know, how do you distinguish between real revelation and phony revelation? Just like you distinguish between true and false prophecy. That you, you want, what you want to hear, it's probably false. <laughs> <laughs> and if it goes against your grain, it's probably right. Right? I know they've made fun of Kant by saying that you know, if you enjoy something too much, it's probably not moral. <laughs> they used to make fun of him uh, about that. Because he, he used the principle of duty rather than the principle of Osho, of, of, uh, as, as a determinant of what gives the moral quality to a deed. But, and I think Rosenzweig shows something of like that kind of view. He's certainly trying to say that what we're looking for, if we want to find distinguish between a genuine revelation from a phony revelation, is the outer voice and not the inner voice. God will amplify the inner voice in order that you should go through the motions of doing what you think is the right alternative, only to come up against the block, which will then remind you of the fact that there was an original command, which was really the right one, and will never be repeated, and you can't try and try and try again to get what you want. The first one is the real one. As opposed to you the opposite to the adage, which goes, if at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Okay? Five minutes. Good. Okay. So now we, we meet up with the kind of things that Bottom encounters on the path. If, it wouldn't have, if the path wouldn't have hurt him so much, maybe he would have just continued going. But he experiences difficult on the path, difficulties on the path that he chose, which reminds him of the original command, which he <coughs> probably conveniently forgot. Okay? Batere ha'aton... Ah, no, we're not there yet. So now we're at a point where they can't even go any further because there's a gate on this side and a gate on that side. No, not at that point yet. We're at a point where there's a Gadir on this side and a Gadir on this side, so that if we do go forward, it's likely that he's going to get his leg crushed against the wall. Okay, now we get the word again. Bilam has not given up with his strategy. If at first you don't succeed, try, try again. Vayosef. I'll try another instrumentality. If I'm blocked here, I'll hit. Mashel, echo nechnumim po baratzayom. <laughs> okay, but, but, Malach Adonai also, by Yosef, right? He also acts, and he goes, by Yosef Malach Adonai Avor, by Amon Bemakom Tsar, Asher Enderf Nintot Yaminu Smod. So now we're at the climax, at the third, at very often in stories, the third time around, things come to a head. Okay? <coughs> And now we have Vayichar Af Bilam. Just like Vayichar Af Hashem. Vayach et Aton Vamakir. So we have a kind of an identification between how Bilam feels about himself and how God felt toward him. He's now angry at himself. Because he's in pain and he hasn't been able to make it through the way he wanted to, and he's tried all of his instrumentalities and they haven't helped. He's now, I think, reminded, this is my expansion of Rosenzweig's interpretation, I think he's now convinced that um, God is probably angry at him for having taken the second path, even though God sanctioned it, and that what he really wanted him to do was take the first path, which means not to go. That's it. Okay? So and he's angry at himself, because he knows that God is probably also angry at him for doing this. Okay? That's what the Vayicharaf, I think, conveys. in other words, the deviation of the ass was not a deviation. The deviation of the ass was in my presence. 
And people should deviate when, I, when they encounter my presence. And what I commanded, I represent God, and what God commanded originally, that was the path. And this is the deviation, not what the ass is doing. The ass is deviating from your deviation. Now the last sentence, right. Zero, okay. So the last sentence you can, I'll just read that, the last sentence one more time in this particular sequence. Chatati means, as we know, I missed the mark. I didn't go on the right path. Say it doesn't work. Maybe somebody could work. Um, but then God says again, just go and do what I tell you, etc. So that, that's the sequence I wanted to read with you. Now what, what is supposed to happen, and I want just a couple of minutes to conclude here. What's supposed to happen with a text like this, first of all, you can see it's very thick. It needs a lot of analysis. We just very barely touched the surface about how it's supposed to be analyzed into its parts and into its word plays and stuff like that. But if you're a sensitive, cognitive, analytic reader, and you, you, see, you see the text, you will also hear, you will also hear what comes out of the text, which is that the whole strategy of Yosef Od is, in Hebrew would say, it's without, it doesn't, it doesn't bear any fruit. And that there's a difference between real revelation and phony revelation. And phony revelation is that kind of more convenient revelation that you would have wanted to hear. And that real revelation is the revelation which comes from God and might very well, it's an outer voice and not an inner voice, and it might very well go against your grain. Read what real revelation is. Now, we all have, this is not just a question about Bilam. We all have questions as to what should be considered real revelation and what should be considered phony revelation. In fact, we all ask ourselves, not just so-called religious people, is there such a thing as revelation? Genuine, is there genuine revelation at all? Or is all revelation just wishful thinking on our part? And here Rosenzweig says that the text addresses us, we can hear the text say to us, through the thicket of cognitive analysis of the word repetitions and the structure, we can hear the text say to us what the distinction between a real revelation and a phony revelation should be. And the text doesn't give you a recipe about what to do in every particular situation, but it does give you a perspective on how to judge yourself when you're asking yourself the question, what's, is there real revelation or not? What's genuine revelation and what's phony revelation? Anyway, um, I wanted to try and apply the category of the interlocking between the epic and the anecdotal within the story, the concrete story that wasn't so I analyze it's still Dara Bama. We have some limits of time for uh, questions or quick uh, responses. So. It, it wasn't clear to me from what you said, and maybe because you're trying, you were trying to be brief. Right. Uh, what is that moment? What, what you identify in that story is that lyrical moment, which right. basically turns and addresses you. Right. It gets you beyond the analytical, which you spoke about before. Right. I I was struck by how quiet and attentive everybody was this time. <laughs> and and I was also struck by the fact that you began by saying that Rosenzweig not only has an extremely kind of you know coherent, consistent philosophy, but he also applied that philosophy systematically to education. And it seemed to me that uh, what's essential here in both readings, that is both what we heard earlier this morning and now, is the necessity for a methodology. That is, and that I think was Jonathan's question. That is, how do we go and use this? It seems to me that in this case we're given more of the tools. And that, uh, you know, how do you get from one reading to another? It's not just the, the fact of the homiletics, it would seem to me, or whether one is more dohak than the other. It's a question of, is there a methodology that we can, you know, that a, an educator can then integrate? So I wanted to thank you for that. I, I think you two questions. One's well, out. Okay, Robbie, then. Okay, yeah. fine. Okay. Um, so the orthodoxy that I was taught when I got to the seminary was historical critical methodologies. We would have attacked that story with source critical analysis. Yada, yada, yada. So um, the idea of trying to read a text 
that on its surface cannot cohere. This text does not cohere. And, and uh, Rosenzweig's insistence on getting a, a message of coherence out of it reminds me of what um, Ed Greenstein wrote about a similarly incoherent narrative, uh, Genesis 37, and say that the, perhaps the point is inscrutability, right? So I'm curious, does Rosenzweig raise the issue of inscrutability that, that much as we want a, a, a coherent revelation, perhaps the point of this narrative is that it cannot give it that. Does he deal in any room? Well, I, I mean, I think you probably know the famous passages from his articles on the Bible about how R is reductor, and he insists that the reduction process is what we would call in Hebrew, Belechet Machshebe. And it's not sloppily done, but it's done in a considered way. And the Prashit Aleph and Prashit Bet are both necessary for us to know who we are as human beings. Not only Soloveitchik said that, or the Ostras, <laughs> but, but Rosenzweig says that too. These are people who understood biblical criticism to a large extent, even internalized it. But they chose to read the text as, oh, as, re as read and not as composed. And uh, therefore, coherence was important for them. So there's a very good article by uh, Matt, uh, Brett, Brett, Mark Brett on coherence. There's a talk that he gave. Ed Greenstein <coughs> tries to get more modesty out of this rather than getting a coherent reading. I know he has an article also on Vahidom Maharon on the yeah. very same thing. In text, I think, different different, that was, that was but to get to get modesty and to get and to get uh, inscrutability, uh, it's kind of it's an, an, also an educational message which you might get Dafka from not being able to get a coherent reading, and that's a very valid way of looking at it. It's not what Rosenzweig necessarily does. He has this kind of cosmological view of the text, which parallels the cosmos itself, but it, he makes room within the cosmos. Now, now I want to get back to Mark's question um, about the lyrical moment. And, and, and the educational issue of the methodology and to tie these two things together. You can overdo the analysis to the point where you can't hear the message. You can, the teacher can intervene massively in one of two ways. To make the text, to make the class just merely methodological. Maybe even aesthetics for aesthetics sake. Look how beautifully built the text is. Right? That's one way of going. Another way is to summarize, as it were, the Musa, which is exactly what Goethe said one should do for kids but which Rosenzweig opposes so violently yeah. in the article, right? You kind of, according to Rosenzweig, you have to take kids through the process of cognitive analysis. And once kids are used to it, once people are used to reading the text in this way, and, 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 and playing the words off one against the other, and seeing where is the stimulus word, and where is the point of word, and where does the word recur, and why does it vary? Once you get used to the methodology, and this methodology becomes second nature, then maybe you don't have to be so intentionally focused. You don't have to have your whole intentionality going on the cognitive analysis because it's second nature, and then you can sort of hear what the text is saying to you about the way you want to be living your life. So, but then the question becomes for education, how much cognitive analysis, even in, from a literary point of view, not to mention historical analysis, but just literary analysis, if you're going to assume coherence, how much do students have to know to be able to hear the Word of God? Well, certainly one thing, I'll, I'll, one, in other words, what Rosenzweig seems to insist on is that the ultimately experiential is to be found in the thick of the cognitive. And that this nigud that we usually find between cognitive education and experiential education is an artificial nigud. And you're not going to get genuine experience if you also don't have cognitive analysis. But cognitive analysis without genuine experience is sterile or purely aesthetic. So that somehow we're going to have to have some kind of form content interaction in our study the goal of which is to listen and not just to read. Okay, I think that should do it unless there's other questions. Yeah, go ahead. Well, you mentioned the poetics, and Aristotle makes the point that a, a narrative should contain anagruesis and uh, herpeteia, which is the, uh, uh, it literally means not, not, not knowing, recognition, or a revelatory point, uh -huh. and then reversal. It seems to correspond with uh, the Rosen slides a, a moment of like revelation mm -hmm. and redemption. Mm -hmm. so this, but also this this occurs with also occurred in Flemish painting in the 16th century where you had very highly structured passion scenes and, and then faces and you see one face gets the point. Mm -hmm. You know, but the point is it should also make us do that. You know, and that's that experiential and I don't know how how one would teach that, see, but I mean, it has to like make me suddenly, you know, uh, look in the mirror. That, that's, right, that's, that's the, the idea. Issue. And how, how do you lead I kids? How do you lead kids through a process like this without massive intervention, either on the cognitive side or on the muster side, which teachers tend to do and kill the whole thing? <laughs>
But on the other hand, also, this thing can't live alone. It has to be in the thick of all this other stuff. Okay, well done. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, <clears throat> and we have a coffee break and we resume.